All right, so on the week of the FOMC meeting, we've started to see a lot of scenarios play out in the markets. Also, you have Coinbase going in and getting a Wells notice. We covered that yesterday. A lot of things strategically are happening within the market, so we thought, hey, let's get an analyst in here to really break this down. I think you guys are going to like this one today. My name is Paul Barrow. Welcome back into Tech Path. Joining me today is Jordi Alexander. He's a macro and crypto trader and the chief investment officer over at Cellini Capital. Great to have you back on the show, Jordi. Great to be back, Paul. Excellent, excellent. So let's uh, let's kind of break into a few things. First, I just want to give you guys a shout out. Cellini Capital, if you guys want to learn a little bit more about what J- Jordi is doing out there, jump over to his website. It's pretty simple. You can learn about SLN Capital, the all weather, and even Cellini Ventures. So you guys are kind of busy over there right now, <laughs> or it seems like yeah, it. Yeah, right? there's a lot. <laughs> a lot happening, right? A lot, of, a lot going on, yeah. And you, you guys are really uh, an, kind of an all-purpose uh, capital investment team, uh, looking at a lot of varieties in technology, obviously centered around blockchain. It, Jordy, is there any one category that you guys special in, uh, specialize in? Uh, decentralized exchanges, I think it's is like the specific sector that we look to be like number one and really understand it the best and also participate very heavily in, in all DEXs. And we really believe in the decentralization path outside of centralized exchanges, especially with FTX and what happened. Yeah, I mean, you obviously we've had you on before talking about FTX and some of the, the breakdowns there uh, that have happened. For To get our, our viewers and listeners in on kind of how you think, I wanted to bring up your, your Twitter page, Game Theorist, First Principles Analyzer. Um, when you look at analyzing and looking at the market as it is right now, especially digital assets, a lot of what's happening from a potential regulatory uh, c- scenario, and you look at what's happening globally, what do you make of kind of some of the things that are really being initiated right here in the United States? Obviously, the Silicon Valley Bank was kind of the domino that began this cascade of, of events. What are your thoughts on the current situation? Yeah, I mean, we all knew that at some point the Fed was going to kind of go too far, break something. I thought it was going to be at two and a half percent or three percent, given the, like the large amount of debt. I never thought that we would get to like, well, we're basically on five now. Um, right. So I don't think five is, is going to really be sustainable. I think by the end of the year, we'll definitely be more towards four. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the crypto attack that's going on right now, with the SEC just going after even blue chips like Coinbase, um, it's telling that we haven't crashed with everything going on. And for me, like this is this is the first time in a while. You know, it's been a year that I feel like the momentum is actually it's very positive. It's kind of shown that right. there is a, there is like a huge product market fit for for crypto uh, in multiple assets. Like not just kind of we'll get into like the banks and the hard money thesis. Uh, we'll also kind of like look at the tech that's the new tech that's that's kind of just you know the layer twos and the scaling and, and some of the other apps that are possible um, and you know at the same time they're trying to shut down the banks they're trying to shut down the rails and you know people are still very keen to get involved so that's that's making me very bullish yeah we've got some data I'll, sh- I'll share with you guys a little later uh, that we shared out on a, a Substack today uh, or this morning it went out um, and it's some additional research that we do on our power index basically where it's tracking market sentiment some interesting demographics that I wanted to get into it but before we go that direction I want to jump over to uh, Deutsche Bank whose share shares obviously uh, were slumping uh, as its credit default swap surge um, Kind of a, a lot of concerns here in the banking sector, Deutsche coming into this. Obviously, we've already seen the Credit Suisse issue among many other potential banks. Now, many banks, potentially, when you look at these unrealized losses, the asset and balance sheets of these bank could be, banks could be in significant trouble. If you go back to what Bellagio, I think most people watching our show will know what we're referencing to in terms of Bellagio, who's been uh, an analyst in the marketplace for some time um, previously, uh, a chief, an executive over at Coinbase. His theory is that we are looking at a potential debase of the dollar and could happen in a very, a very um, quick and serious way. What are your thoughts on that? Because this 90-day run to 1 million, first time I heard it, I almost thought it was a bait, you know, a clickbait. Then I heard his thesis and I was like, no, he's, he's really serious here. So what, what, how did you respond to that when you first heard it? 
Yeah, similarly, like I thought, okay, this cannot be serious. And um, I've gone deeper into what he's saying and he's serious, he does believe it. Um, yeah. I don't think he's correct about anything resembling 90 days or, you know, even a year. Um, but, you know, a lot of his points make people think. And I think that's the good thing. I respect him a lot, especially with, uh, you know, the COVID times and, and how he predicted a lot of the uh, the really early warning signs on COVID. So I, I, I respect him tremendously. Um, none of that's going to happen in 90 days. Like we are, we are very far from uh, the eventual dollar debasement that will happen. And the challenge to the dollar being the, um, you know, de facto, you know, core currency of the entire globe, that also will be challenged, but in a very slow process and not in this kind of like uh, 90 day period. Um, there's a few reasons, like one, people are seem to be forgetting and maybe only fixed income people are realizing this, but the situation with the banks uh, potentially is getting a lot better because bonds are rallying out of fear. And this is very different than 2008 because the collateral that uh, all these banks have is actually U.S. Treasuries. It's not mm -hmm. mortgage-backed security. And the mortgages are, you know, that would be a much bigger problem. That would be an FTX type of problem where the coffers have been emptied and you open and there's nothing there. Here we actually have U.S. Treasuries. Yes, they have marked to market in, in a nasty way, and that has caused liquidity issues for certain banks that went too far. Uh, obviously. We've already had a couple of casualties um, that kind of fall into that category. But the reality is these are getting marked now in the other direction because treasuries are uh, kind of coming back. And these balance sheets are going to be looking a lot healthier right now than they, than they were two weeks ago. So everything that we're seeing now that's still kind of breaking, it's stuff that was breaking for months and months and people were just kind right. of like trying to tape it together. But actually, the the most recent momentum is positive. So I don't think we're anywhere near a a sudden collapse in the in the dollar. And even if um, we were, I don't think that Bitcoin is yet people are not yet comfortable enough or familiar enough with how to you know use it and have it on a hardware wallet or how to handle it. I don't think that we would suddenly see a hyper Bitcoinization, um, even though you know it's a great kind of thing to think about as, as a thought experiment. Yeah, well, I, there's two ways you can kind of take it. Um, and, and, you know, looking at the market in, I think, a very, you know, both sides of the game uh, scenario that we do here on this show. I mean, you could look at uh, Balaji's approach as, you know, hey, he's talking his own book. Of course, you know, he wins if this goes up. Uh, he can handle the, you know, the million, million dollar bet uh, from that aspect. But if he loses, I mean, that, that's a little different angle. And, and then I think that's, that's one of the things you have to look at in comparison to that. But you also look at just a list of the banks. This was a tweet that came in on, just on bank stocks that remain still in pain after the Credit Suisse rescue. And this is a pretty significant group of banks that, again, like to your point, could be in just short-term pain. Uh, these are mostly investors that are uh, investing in the stock itself not necessarily the depositors in the bank itself. So that is one factor that plays into this. But you also look at the potential of what Caitlin Long's talked about, and that is where we're seeing more and more focus of mid-sized to regional banks and even small community banks that essentially could disappear because of the exodus of depositors. Now, that's a real scenario that's not necessarily tied to assets. This is just a sentiment-based uh, run. Somebody that says, hey, you know, I'm going to exit out of my local community bank and I'm going to drop into JP Morgan. If that happens and we do see a mass exodus going into the major banks, would this make it easier for the Biden administration regulation at, you know, in the normal state, back to Balaji's thesis around, you know, how the Fed now project could become a new CBDC de facto and get into controlled currency because now you've got maybe a nationalized banking system because of the so few banks. How do you think that could play out? And do you think that scenario is valid? I mean, I think that it's, it's potentially uh, a situation where we have some small banks disappear. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that they need to exist. They, they facilitate certain like lending and certain parts of, of the market that 
yeah, like maybe we will go into a mild recession if those get shut down and it's harder uh, for people to get credit that would be, they would normally go to like a, a local bank. Um, but it's the same thing with, uh, you know, centralization and social media and anything else. Like, do you need a hundred tiny platforms or do you just have a few big banks that have branches everywhere and, and can, you know, service a, a broad segment of the population? I don't think that certain like community banks uh, having to go out of business is necessarily going to lead to, you know, a sudden rethinking about CBDCs and like kind of right. com completely managing everything. I do think that we will eventually get there. So the path uh, that I see is going through yield curve control. And what that means is that even though right now treasuries are going up, that's actually like helping relieving the pressure and it's going to uh, create more inflation. Eventually, I think the way this plays out over the next, you know, six to kind of 18 months at some point people will not want to hold those treasuries mm -hmm. maybe the government's spending too much money so there's too much too many auctions going on and like you're, you're having kind of uh, failed auctions maybe foreigners are not buying uh, u.s treasuries maybe they, they want to kind of stick to other commodities or something else that's when you actually have a problem that's when this really starts going and then we can start seeing some of the things that balaji is talking about um where there's no bid on treasuries anymore because people don't want to have the U.S. government debt. And then they really come in hard and start like nationalizing things and, you know, forcing people to have certain styles of CBDCs. I've talked about CBDCs in the past and uh, it does give them a lot more control than the current fiat system. Like they can start programming certain features into the digital currencies. They can make you spend money and or lose it. They can make you spend it on certain things and not other things, they can, they can really kind of start to become uh, much more of a controlled state. We'll get to those things in a few years, but yeah. we're, we're first gonna have to go through like a yield curve control situation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to play a clip uh, for you in the audience. Uh, this is coming from David Sachs. He's in the All In podcast. David is a, uh, you know, he's kind of a venture capital. He focuses on SaaS products out there. He's been around the, the block pretty well, understands a lot of what's happening not only in the markets, but politically as well. Listen to what his, uh, his thesis is on this case. I think about it. I, um, I, I post my own. All right, let me give you, we'll come back to that clip because it did not come through. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, but what Sachs was getting at was a couple of things. And the biggest issue was this whole idea around what Balaji was trying to get at. He's not necessarily in the point of disagreeing with him. He's actually, to your point, I think it's just maybe a timeline uh, ratio of here. But my, my theory, though, and the question around this is, is if you look on the global scale of what's happening, whether it's in China, you look at Russia, the deals that are being made outside the United States, you apply what kind of, again, back to what Balaji was saying is almost a flight to safety. He was claiming, hey, you should get your Bitcoin and get out of these, these uh, you know, jurisdictions. Do you think the global aspect of this starts to open up these huge opportunities for places like the Pacific Rim, Asia, the Middle East, et cetera, to really become the power centers of where finance might be in the future? Yeah, I mean, things will change. I think commodities are going to play a larger role because things like energy, you know, you can't print energy, you can't print a barrel of oil. And um, that's, that's going to be something that will be at the core of everyone's needs is having energy, energy independence. Um, the fact that crude oil is kind of sub 70 has presented an opportunity maybe for, uh, for some strategic kind of purchases there. I think the really interesting thing is going to be on gold. Like what, what's gold's role going to be? We haven't seen gold in this kind of post 1970 era and we don't know exactly how it's going to behave. We're in a very digital world now. And there's a lot of people who think that Bitcoin being a more digital version of gold is completely uh, a much better aspect of it. Although we are seeing central banks like Russia and China, they are buying gold. Um, right. So they're kind of sticking to like the basics and makes a lot of sense because that's, you know, it's, it's a very Lindy uh, place to go. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, the Yuan or any other currency necessarily will be a good replacement for the dollar. So, we might see something new and it's kind of exciting. Like we're living in this age So we're seeing, for example, in South America, a lot of the countries are banging, uh, kind of grouping together, Brazil, mm -hmm. Argentina, and they're thinking about making their own kind of currency for the whole continent. So that'll be a completely new currency that has different properties.
that we haven't seen a tremendous volatility, even with a 25 basis points and somewhat of a doomsday kind of theory from uh, Chair Powell and how he was looking at trying to deal with the current inflation. In the past FOMCs, actually, we would have seen Bitcoin probably take a fairly good hit. That did not necessarily take place, at least not immediately after, you know, with that with that kind of event. I want to jump back to this clip here from uh, from Sachs. I think we have the sound now. Let me play this for you. What, what do I think about it? I, um, I I posted my own theory today, which I would call sort of bulgy light, um, which is um, OK, look, if you if you think about this spike in interest rates that we've had and that Jamal thinks will actually continue quite a bit longer, there are three main effects that it indisputably has. Number one, undercuts the value of long dated bonds. Number two, it's made lending much more expensive, particularly for big purchases like real estate. Number three, it's increased government lending costs. Okay, now play that through the financial system. What does that mean? Well, if the value of long dated bonds has sharply decreased, well, that's led to this banking crisis with the unrealized losses. So that's already happened. Number two, it's made lending more expensive, the credit crunch and CRE. We're beginning to see that. And I believe that's going to play out as the second crisis of this larger financial crisis. And then number three is the increase in government borrowing costs that will eventually play out in terms of being a government debt crisis of some kind. And I think it'll involve, you know, a spike in borrowing costs at the federal level and involve sovereign debt issues internationally. I think it'll involve budget deficits at states and cities. So I think there's three phases to this financial crisis. We're in phase one, and I think CRE and government debt are the next two phases. And I think so. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it there. So uh, obviously, commercial real estate, big factor right now because of the fact that most of these regional and small community banks hold most of that paper. Uh, obviously, if that were to go away, we could see a significant problem. Again, those start those rolling effects, kind of like rolling blackouts. And then you go into uh, the debt crisis, potentially what David's talking about there. What do you think about his theory of how this could scale in? I mean, commercial real estate is is a weak point in the system. It, it could kind of lead to some losses. The way to think about, um, I guess, first principles of, about all this is the problems come in when people think they have money that they don't actually have. So, right. you know, FTX is a very simple example. Like, you know, you, you see the number there in your head. You're like, okay, I have $100,000 on FTX and I can go buy stuff. When you realize that you don't have it, that causes a huge crisis, liquidity crisis. Nobody has money that they thought they had. Maybe I had kind of already pledged half of that to somebody else. I don't have it. So right now we had a little bit of that with the banks where, you know, depositors got very freaked out that the money that they actually thought was in the bank maybe wasn't there. And that's starting to like create like ripple effects through the economy. So when you have kind of similar to like 2008, like, uh, you know, some kind of uh, mortgages or anything like commercial real estate uh, investments that end up not being marked to market properly, it right. creates a liquidity gap where people have to realize that actually I don't have what I thought I had. And that reprices what they're willing to spend and what they're willing to do. And that's how, you know, we get economic cycles and we just go into like a recession. Um, I think we've all been expecting a recession for a while. And we kind of got through COVID with like this, it was the opposite effect of what I'm describing. Instead of, instead of a liquidity gap, we had kind of like this overwhelming liquidity uh, increase where everybody thought they were getting rich. Nobody was doing anything. Everybody was at home. But suddenly like they were getting airdrops of stimmies and everything else. And, and people felt like they were getting rich. So we, we had the opposite effect. And as we know, at the end of the day, you know, the amount of things that are getting created in the world, the amount of cars, the amount of kind of buildings and houses and everything that are getting created doesn't really change. Like we have a limited number of people building things. So those are constant. If you kind of think that you have more than you have, at some point you're going to realize you have less than you have. And we're right. going to kind of like go into like a recession. It could be a mild recession though. All right. So with that, that, you know, token of information you just gave. I want to go to this tweet, and that is uh, Secretary Yellen. She says, okay, we're, we're going to pull the regulators in. This is an unscheduled meeting, um, close to the public. She's already been kind of dragged through the mud a bit about her non-understanding of what was happening in the, at the bank level. And that, then kind of that flip side of her changing her tune and saying, hey, yes, we're going to backstop what do you think is going to happen here? I mean, with this meeting, the, there, this is clearly about the banking industry in the United States. 
Where do you think the uh, Fed and the government is going to stand once all the rubble has kind of calmed down to a certain extent? So both uh, Yellen, but also Powell, uh, do not understand moral hazard very well. So moral hazard is basically like when you're incentivizing bad behavior from the system and you're being a bad referee and the mm -hmm. Fed's job is to be a good referee. So what we saw like in 2020, when COVID was happening, junk bonds were getting bailed out. Like you right. cannot have a situation <laughs> where the world economy is, 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 stop, is stopping completely and you've invested in junk bonds, you should take a hit. Like that's kind of like the normal uh, way of things. Like you make a bet, it doesn't work out. Instead, you know, they came in and they bought junk bonds. So that's being a bad referee. That's basically saying you can take on risk and we will bail you out. And that right. stays in people's minds. And then the next time they're, they're kind of over leveraging, expecting to be bailed out. The Fed has never understood this, neither with Yellen nor with Powell. Powell was going on about, you know, oh, you know, it's no, it's nobody's fault that COVID happened. Yeah, it's no one's fault, but you're not five years old. Like you need to understand, like sometimes bad things happen in the world. There's, there's bad luck and you have to just accept losses. You can't bail everybody out because that right. creates bigger and bigger problems down the system, which we're now seeing through like the inflation. And I think now with the banks, they're kind of similarly like forgetting all the moral hazard. You know, a lot of these depositors were in unsecured dollar debasement um, at some point, just not like in a kind of sudden way, but it does. Well, I don't know, Jordy, this feels pretty sudden to me. I mean, three weeks ago, nobody was seeing these kinds of scenarios pop up. All of a sudden, you know, in a span of a week, we have one of the top 20 banks in the country really go to zero. And if you think about the people that had deposits in there, you know, Oprah Winfrey, I mean, even Megan and Harry had deposits in there. We had some pretty significant people along with most of Silicon Valley, which was really, I think, the contributing factor for the Fed to swoop in and say, hey, we're going to cover all deposits, which is an unprecedented event. Uh, I've been involved in a bank that went bust over 20 years ago, 250K, you know, in the FDIC, it wasn't quite 20 years ago. But the point is, is that they held right to the normal FDIC insurance that has always been the case and always, I'm assuming, will be. With that being the case of the next bank and then the next bank, at some point, there's going to be a problem. And I think, the back to your point earlier, is that just the faith in not only the U.S. dollar, but in the U.S. banking system, because as you know, it's like a, in a crowded theater, someone yells fire and it is, it's on. That's a problem right now that could be happening in the United States. What would get us out of this? What do you think would be the correct actions that at least would you know, slow it down, if anything, and it get at least the government and the, and the Fed back on a track to where we were trying to correct, and that is just getting inflation down and dealing with price stability? I mean, uh, there is like a deflationary aspect to what's happening. Like credit is going to tighten up. Like people are mm -hmm. being like rest, less um, risky with like lending out money. And that will eventually kind of cool down inflation to a certain extent because people will have a hard time leveraging up and, and buying more things. So there is in the short term, like I've been saying, a kind of uh, a headwind to like spiraling inflation and, and like dollar debasement because of the credit suck and like, you know, people are going to be right. like temporarily a little bit less risk, uh, risk loving. The problem I think is further down the road where they start pausing. They're going to pause. I don't think we're going to see another interest rate hike. I think we're definitely okay. done at this point. Then they start kind of like bailing out everybody because they don't want to create panic and they keep kind of doing this moral hazard stuff. That's going to need to like a, that's going to eventually lead to a second wave of inflation that could be like even bigger than the one that we saw. So right. I think for now, there's going to be a bit of a bit of like a deflation, a bit of calm, you know, everyone's scared. There's not much lending going on, but we're seeing, we're seeing already like the pumps that we're getting in, uh, not just crypto, but like, you know, some equity markets and, and certain things where people are already trying to front run the exactly. cuts that are coming because they can see them. And that will eventually lead to like another wave of inflation, which I think kind of gets to this like yield curve control world. Yeah, for sure. I was looking at this chart from TradingView. It just kind of showed uh, Bitcoin versus the banking crisis. It's not really a fair chart, but it is one that you can at least, if you're a layman and you're looking at this in terms of the price of Bitcoin and what's been happening with these publicly traded banks, First Republic, Silvergate, 
Silicon Valley, Credit Suisse, all pretty much on the floor. And then you look at this. Now go back to uh, the thesis, kind of a, a hybrid between what Sachs has talked about, Balaji has talked about, and what you're talking about more long term, but the effect essentially is eventually somewhat the same. You look at long-term holders of a digital asset, whether it's Bitcoin, altcoins, whatever it might be. The, the, the real shift to me, at least when we study this, when our, you know, our network is dedicated to this new technology. And one of the things that we continue to watch just in the data sets that we're pulling is a slow but steady increase in new audience coming in. Now we haven't seen a mass move in to the market like what we saw in the last bull run. But we're supposed to be in a bear market, and we're supposed to be in the middle of inflationary uh, times. We've got banks failing all around us, but yet at the same time, we're seeing this slow tick into digital assets. Do you feel that that is kind of that those little tremor waves before the tsunami potentially that could be coming into this marketplace? Yeah, definitely. Like there is a narrative that's potentially going to build and build and build, especially because like price is the strongest narrative of all. And if you manage to perform well during what's a rough period, that can kind of like bring in new people who say, oh, wow, this is actually, there's something I, I need to pay attention to. So I think we're grabbing attention right now as like a, you know, digital asset community. We're saying, look, everything else can fall apart. We're kind of behaving like gold. Gold is doing pretty well right now. Bitcoin is digital gold. And then the funny thing is like even these altcoins that, they're, they are bleeding compared to Bitcoin, like they're not performing as well, but they're doing right. relatively okay because as we know, like when Bitcoin does well, there's a wealth effect in, in the crypto verse and some of that spills over to, you know, all the other coins as well. So even though they are not digital gold, they're kind of riding that wave with Bitcoin a little bit. Yeah, I was just looking at the, uh, the gold chart here. This is just the, the most recent, this going back to just March you know, March 8th, uh, a small move. But again, gold doesn't typically get massive moves on the market, but it has been uh, back to somewhat of its local highs that we've seen over the past year. So the, interesting that, uh, that that continues to be the case. The, the idea of the decoupling, let me talk about that for a second. Let me go find that tweet. Here we go. This one right here was by Macro Daily. They were showing the, uh, uh, you know, the S&P 500, uh, the Dow, you can kind of see the light blue is, is Ethereum, the dark blue being uh, Bitcoin, these two assets, versus what we're seeing here. Are we potentially witnessing a decoupling of these assets from the traditional finance market for the first time? What are your, what's your thought on this? Yeah, so as I was saying at the very start of the show, this is kind of what I'm seeing that's making me kind of excited and, and bullish on, on everything going on because it's a very clear decoupling. Like, I mean... It, the, the chart you showed was not against like Credit Suisse and like, you know, the, the previous one, which was a bit more handpicked. We're just looking at it versus, you know, S&P 500 and, and everything well, else. Clearly, um, okay, now we have to admit like some of it was because last year, you know, with FTX, there was, there was maybe an abnormal dip that we are kind of climbing out of. Uh, you know, we had this dip to like 16K, which maybe... That was the last time we'll see uh, prices like that for um, for Bitcoin and like sub 1000 ETH. Maybe we'll, yeah. maybe we won't see that again. Um, so part of that is like a mean reversion there. But clearly, like we are riding the gold wave and 10 percent in gold is is a good amount uh, mm -hmm. of, for such a big kind of slow traditional slow asset. Lumbering it, asset. It is, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. I want to jump to uh, the gold debate because that's one where I think we're going to have Peter Schiff on our show which is ironic, us being a tech and digital asset. But, but the point is, is that if you look at this tweet here from Balaji, he was talking about, you know, that gold was already defeated by the state. This essentially was how the gold standard was pretty much reversed, uh, where you could not hold gold if you were an individual. And there are some now that are in fear that maybe that happens to Bitcoin. Now, what's your theory? It's a little different since, you know, we are talking about a digital age, um, you know, instantaneous movement of funds, a global market versus what we're seeing here in the U.S. But there's a little bit of connection here. What are your thoughts on this theory that there is a, a constructed effort, Caitlin Lawn's theory, you know, uh, minis, you know, you look at the choke point analysis uh, out there. 
Do you think this would have any kind of bearing where the U.S. government would essentially one time just say, hey, Bitcoin is uh, not legal to hold for a United States citizen? So I think that, you know, to say like something really good about Bitcoin, I think it's actually designed to withstand this kind of attack. Um, mm -hmm. I think if they come out and say that it will cause all kinds of problems. First of all, they will give credibility and everybody will be wondering, exactly. why are they so scared? <laughs> why are they so scared of this thing? Like maybe... You know, gold maybe didn't need that credibility because gold was actually money back then. Like that was what everything was backed by gold. So they could try to kind of interfere in like uh, gold and it wouldn't give gold credibility. But if they do that with Bitcoin or, or crypto in, in general, it would cause all kinds of alarms. And we're not in, you know, we're not in a Chinese kind of uh, authoritarian state. In the West, I think people think for themselves and they, they would not allow this kind of like heavy handedness. So it makes sense what they're actually doing. They're trying to kind of go to the institutions and try to shut down the institutions, try to shut down the rails, make it harder to do banking. That's also having a kind of like a two-sided effect because they're also showing right. that we really do need an alternative to, you know, these traditional rails. And something I've written a tweet about recently is that actually if you shut down all the rails and we just get stuck with like, you know, Bitcoin ETH, but we can't change it into fiat. It doesn't stop people from like transacting and buying each other's time and services for, you know, these digital assets, even if you That's can't true. like maybe uh, change it into like dollars very easily in an ATM or something. But I might still be say, OK, like, there's only 21 million of these Bitcoin. I'm willing to like work for you and, you know, do a project for you and get paid in, in this digital asset. And, you know, as long as I have food to eat, like I'm happy to keep my savings in that. I think there could be this kind of opt out parallel parallel system. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't think they can do anything about it. I, I, I don't see like the end of the day, the way that they can fully attack it. I think gold's a an interesting one. I think the role of gold has changed. It's no longer going to be an opt out of the system against the government. Gold, the way I see it now, geopolitically is it's a game between the central banks, between each other. Right. It's not about people and retail. And like, I don't think Peter Schiff understands that the world has changed now. We're in a very different world, but between, you know, the bank of Russia and China and Switzerland and the UK, like they do have this kind of musical chairs thing going with gold and who's buying it. And they're, they're kind of organizing themselves with gold. And I think the retail is organizing themselves with Bitcoin or Ethereum. You know, I think that's still kind of being figured out. We've had Greg Foss on the show a couple of times. He's pretty outspoken on this. I don't know if you know, Greg, uh, Greg Foss out there. His statement is, uh, you know, QE if infinity here. Let me kind of zoom up on that. It was, it was always, only the escape from a fiat Ponzi debt spiral. This is his whole theory. Uh, thank goodness the Bank of Canada is there, there too, he being Canadian. Um, but his point has been, he's been on the show a couple of times, is that this is one, in fact, he and I were talking about f a week prior to the Credit Suisse situation. We had him on the show. And he pretty much called the Credit Suisse situation and said, listen, they're doomed. It's going to happen. It's just around the corner. And uh, next week we hear uh, Credit Suisse is, is pretty much in, in trouble. But they too, when you look at what, what Greg's position has been, is the fiat, the fiat spiral that could happen. And back to your point, you're thinking possibly over a period of many years, you know, as any currency cycle typically goes. Uh, what do you think when we look at a, sp a fiat spiral and most likely destined to happen within the U.S.? Outside of Bitcoin, gold, where do you think some of the power centers are going to be in the financial community? Uh, power centers, you mean globally or what, what well, type of power globally, centers? Yeah, globally in terms of assets. So, uh, you know, if you're holding a U.S. dollar, you know, the debasement of that could be, you know, X, Y, Z. Uh, but the opportunity here with Bitcoin is this. We know gold is doing this. And globally... Does it flip over into something like the digital yuan or do we see other currencies rise uh, potentially within these other markets? Or is that the birth of the digital uh, era and Bitcoin and other assets like it start to take place? Yeah, the one thing uh, nobody talks about enough is like the concept of seniorage. So seniorage means like who's able to create something that everybody else accepts as money. And it's a very... Uh, privileged position to be in where you can say, I'm just going to print something and everybody else is going to be a slave to work, you know, to earn this thing that I've created. So the U.S. dollar has had that role and the, the globe has kind of accepted it, probably because of like the military might, 
probably because of, you know, maybe like the intellectual uh, strength of the country for, for many decades. I think what's, what the next steps are over the next couple of years, countries will rebel against the dollar. Obviously, Russia has already done that. China is already doing it. Right. I think when Europe starts to say, hey, like you're exporting inflation to us, you're in a better spot than we are because you mm -hmm. can you can print yourselves out of issues. We can't. Like the UK just had a print of inflation a couple of days ago. They're back over 10%. We're kind of spiraling below 6% now. There's going to come a point where all these other countries, they're having a much harder time. They're going to have harder recessions. They're going to say, this is because of your privilege to have seniorage and print more dollars and you can kind of export it to us. We don't like that. We're going to look for alternatives. Now, right. it's not easy to have an alternative, which is why we're kind of stuck in this situation for, for now. But eventually we could see things like oil backed currencies or mm -hmm. some commodity backed currencies or some other kind of uh, you know continental grouping of currencies that could start to rival. Um, but I think, yeah, like gold, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, all these things will come to people's minds. People are in a digital age now. We're in a very fast moving. We're seeing like ChatGPT. We're seeing all this AI mm -hmm. improvements that are clearly moving us in a world where the power, you know, digitally is going to be so much stronger than even like five years ago. So I'm betting on digital. I'm not betting on gold. I think gold is kind of a little bit outside, but it doesn't mean it's going to be Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin has its own issues, long-term security. Maybe it's too centralized in the sense of like the, the ownership of it. Maybe too many people own too much percent of it. So you exactly. can imagine a world yeah. where if, if Balaji gets a million dollar Bitcoin, we're going to have like multi-trillionaires who just did not really nothing but just hodl for like, you know, 20 years. Uh, yeah. Is society going to accept that? I'm not sure that it's going to be considered fair by like the large amounts of society who don't have any and then you have a trillionaire. Like, I'm not sure we're going to see that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with your point because there there is a little bit of that already in society today when you get a little bit of the pushback. Um, I do courses uh, with high net worth people on uh, often, and I see some of that within the community, people who have held their in business, and then you get kind of the opposite effect of people saying, you know, why should you be, you know, in reality, it's just this guy is a smarter person. You know, they figured it out. Uh, just like they got into business and were doing something. The difference is it's a HODL model versus, hey, I really worked hard to grow a business. But if you think about it, an investor HODLing Bitcoin or Ethereum, they've worked pretty hard right now <laughs> over this last year. <laughs> In essence, I mean, I feel like this is a job just HODLing, holding uh, these so, assets. So, Paul, what you said is a joke and we're, and we're laughing, but actually there's a lot of wisdom to what you said. So <laughs> exactly. I think the reason we have these, the reason we have these dips is to shake out the weak hands. And then yes. like, if you're holding, you kind of like deserve it. And if you have <laughs> too much, if you're concentrated, like your entire wealth, maybe you get shaken out. And that actually helps because it kind of distributes the tokens a little bit. You can't have 90% of your asset in something that can fall 80%. And that forces you to like distribute to other people, which is mm -hmm. positive in the long run. Yeah. Well, and it also, I think it just trains the investor into diversified assets and a good diversified portfolio, which is just common sense when it comes to investing. So, you know, we coach this all the time. Not that we coach on investing, but we look at technology and we understand that is a powerful tool of not putting everything in one tech or another because you just never know how, how the market is going to take it. Speaking of that, I want to jump over quickly to ETH. Uh, ZK Sync era now, first e, uh, ZK EVM goes live. Uh, so this is a major development for Ethereum. Uh, obviously, we've got moves with MetaMask. There's a lot happening in this ecosystem. ETH could absolutely just explode here with in terms of not only use case, but the potential of becoming maybe the real world asset layer when it comes to moving money, moving assets, and digital value around. What are your thoughts of where Ethereum could be, not value-wise, but just in the sense of how well Ethereum will perform against other digital assets, including Bitcoin? I think Ethereum's merge kind of changed uh, changed the game a little bit. Maybe it's because of the Shanghai upgrade that's coming next month that you know if, if Ethereum hasn't like outperformed uh, that well compared to like um, what, what you might expect, because people are kind of waiting for a potential unlocking of a lot of Ethereum that might hit the market. I think right after we get through that, so you know, uh, maybe maybe a few weeks after, um, 
and the market realizes, okay, there's no huge dump, like we're kind of, uh, we're kind of solidified uh, on the base. Ethereum has incredible Ponzi-nomics, right? Like the burn and the getting deflationary, you're gonna need uh, to find a hard, it's, it's gonna be hard to find an argument why uh, it won't go up and it'll just keep right. going up. It, it's, it's very well designed. Um, you have all these ecosystems building on top of it and they're burning gas. So slowly but surely, at some point you get a supply crisis. And by supply crisis, I mean, there's not gonna be a lot of sellers. <laughs> and so like, you're gonna have a harder, harder time kind of finding sellers as you go up. Um, so in the, in the kind of like the medium term, I am quite bullish Ethereum. Um, I think Bitcoin does have a halvening at some point. We're not too far away from that next halvening. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also positive. Uh, but Ethereum's deflationary tokenomics have not been priced in the market yet. Yeah, I think you're exactly right on Ethereum. Uh, it's one of those assets that I still feel is underperforming what its core value is, uh, where I think Bitcoin is pretty much priced to market uh, right now based on what we see, at least in the sentiment data and some of those things. Uh, Jordy, this has been fun. Uh, I want to jump over to our poll real quick and see what the audience thinks about uh, these. Will another bank collapse before the end of the week? This is uh, people still saying that this is a problem. We're going to continue to see banking uh, problems. And a couple of questions that came in uh, from the audience uh, in reference to the Coinbase scenario. Do you think Coinbase survives this Wells Notice and this kind of this barrage against them? Uh, you know, a publicly traded, we had an attorney, and a, a securities attorney on the show just yesterday. And he looked at this. He's already been in these kinds of cases many times. You know, it's a publicly traded, well-documented company. And yet, at the same time, we had the SEC. Do you think they hold out? and uh, continue to fight the fight? I mean, let's look at what happened with Ripple. I mean, Ripple is a much weaker version of Coinbase. They don't they don't yeah. have quite as much gravitas. And yeah, like maybe they are a security. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say. Like people really have to kind of dig in and look at it. But with Coinbase, if you consider that Ripple has had a three-year fight that they might actually win. I mean, it looks look like it's, maybe it's Coindash right now. We don't know yet. Sure. Coinbase can really kind of take it to the SEC. And by the time, you know, this really kind of goes forward, maybe we have a new administration. It's not Gensler anymore. Right. Maybe we have a diff different president, different person there, different opinions. Maybe they just settle something, you know, without too much fuss. Um, on the other hand, like the bearish take is that the SEC probably has a clear idea of what they're planning to do. Otherwise, they wouldn't go through this process. So they're not just kind of like randomly giving out Wells notices, they have a plan. Um, I think Coinbase is gonna fight it. They're potentially gonna drag it out and it won't be that easy. I don't think it's gonna be that easy. Yeah, well, I I, I would uh, kind of counter to that. I don't think the SEC has a plan because clearly they've been kind of you know shunned by just what I think are just, I won't say average attorneys, but normal attorneys versus what, especially when you look at how Ripple has been able to defend against them. Uh, granted, the SEC made a lot of mistakes. Yet it, now you've got a publicly traded company that already went through an IPO process, which is as pretty detailed as you can go through. And uh, Coinbase's you know, response to that has been pretty simple. We haven't changed our business model since you, since we went public right in front of your noses. You know, so. Uh, I think it's a great argument. And, you know, the securities attorney we had on yesterday uh, kind of landed in, in that same position is that this is uh, it's going to be an interesting one. Could be the one that would be for the books, meaning possibly getting a Supreme Court decision on a lot of these things. So, Jordy, thank you so much again for stopping in today. We appreciate your time. Uh, always fun talking to you. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. Excellent. All right, so you guys are tuned in over on the podcast side of things right now. Jump on over here on the YouTube channel. This is where we do all the deep dives, charts, analysis, all that. We've got a three o'clock coming up later today. We're going to be doing some uh, charts with Tim Warren. We'll break down where Bitcoin and Ethereum is going to go. So make sure and set your uh, notifications for that. We'll be jumping into that. We're also going to reveal some new data on sentiment. If you're in the diamond circle, you got an email this morning that broke out some of that additional demographic data. Uh, so have you? if you haven't joined in the Diamond Circle, get in now. But we'll give you that, uh, that additional info today at uh, later in the, in the day. I, actually, I think it's at 2 o'clock Eastern, not, not 3. Yeah, 2 o'clock Eastern, 2 o'clock Eastern today. Uh, and again, if you guys uh, want to reach me, it's out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.